Welcome back to U.S. History with Mr. Snyder. Today we're going to be talking about the beginning of the Civil War, starting with the election of 1860. Here are your targets for today. We're going to compare the candidates in the election of 1860 and analyze the results along southern and northern lines. We're going to analyze why the southern states seceded from the Union, and we're going to take a look at the first event of the war, or what's looked at as the first event of the war, the bombing of Fort Sumter. But the election of 1860 really comes down to four people, and there's really two in the north and two in the south. Abraham Lincoln, obviously the winner, did not even appear on southern ballots. And he was not even the front-runner Republican at first, but Abraham Lincoln met the Republican specifications. He's from Illinois. He's a state that, which is a state that Republicans needed to win. He has a more moderate image than a lot of other straight Republicans. He also kept himself from something called the Know Nothing Party, which was an anti-immigrant party. So anti-Catholicism, anti-Irish, anti-German. In addition, he's a self-made man, and he was born on the frontier, lived in Kentucky and Indiana, and finally Illinois, and he becomes a legal um, scholar and a lawyer and a, uh, rises to political prominence, and that embodies the Republican ideal of equal opportunity for all. And the Republicans' platform was meant to broaden the party's appeal in the North. They don't want slavery allowed in the territories, but they also don't want er interference to slavery in its current states. The Democrats, however, you can see Stephen Douglas is a Northern Democrat. The Democrats failed to present a united front. When the party first met in the heat of Charleston in late April, Douglas commanded a majority of the delegates, but was unable to win the two-thirds required for nomination due to Southern opposition. He did succeed in getting the convention to endorse popular sovereignty as its slavery platform, but the Deep South delegates walked out of the convention, and they favored a federal slave code for territories. And so this results in a fracture of the Democratic Party. And if you fracture one of the major parties, the vote is going to split and their, their candidates, neither one of the candidates are going to win. The delegates who remained at that convention nominated Douglas and reaffirmed the party's commitment to popular sovereignty. And the people who bolted elsewhere convened and nominated John Breckinridge of Kentucky and he wants slavery in the territories and federal protection of slavery in the territories. And so that's John Breckinridge, the Southern Democrat nominee. And then John Bell is a constitutional unionist. And the constitutional unionists are some old school Whigs and people from the Know Nothing Party or the anti-immigrant party. And they don't have an explicit stance on slavery in the territories. They try to represent um, the spirit of this sectional accommodation that had led to the compromises of 1820 and 1850. So in effect, this race becomes a separate two-party contest in each section of the country. In the north, the real choice is between Lincoln and Douglas. In the south, the only candidates with a chance were Breckinridge and John Bell. So let's analyze the results. When the results came in, the Republicans had a stunning victory. They expected to win, but not by this much. By gaining the electoral votes of all the free states in purple there, including Oregon and California, except those from three districts of New Jersey that voted for Douglas, Lincoln won a decisive majority. He had 180 votes over 123 of his opponents combined. In the North, his 54% of the popular vote annihilated Douglas. Douglas only wins one state and half of New Jersey. In the South, where Lincoln was not even on the ballot, Breckinridge triumphed everywhere except in Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee, which went for Bell and the Constitutional Unionists. So you can see the South goes with the overwhelming majority platform of the Southern Democrats, the 
middle border states here, which West Virginia will become a border state, Kentucky will, Tennessee will not, they'll secede, they go with John Bell, who sort of wants to keep the Union together. Most Southerners saw this result of the election as a catastrophe. A candidate and a party with no support in their own section had won the presidency on a platform viewed as insulting to Southern honor and hostile to vital Southern interests like slavery and their economic well-being. Rather than accepting permanent minority status in American politics and facing the resulting dangers to black slavery and white liberty, the political leaders from the Lower South launch a movement for immediate secession from the Union. South Carolina, which had long been in the forefront of Southern rights and pro-slavery agitation, as we see from the nullification crisis in the 1830s, they're the first state to secede. On December 20th, 1860, a convention meeting in Charleston declared unanimously that, quote, the Union now subsisting between South Carolina and other states under the name of the United States of America is hereby dissolved, end quote. The constitutional theory behind secession was that the Union was a compact among sovereign states or an agreement among the sovereign states. Each of those states could withdraw from the Union by the vote of a convention similar to the one that had initially ratified the Constitution. The South Carolinians justified seceding at that time by charging that a sectional party had elected a president, quote, whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. By February 1st of 1861, seven states had removed themselves from the Union. South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. In the Upper South, however, economic diversification had increased the importance of free labor and ties to the northern economy. So in the states like Virginia and Kentucky, it is an only relying on slavery. They have diversified their economy and now have more factories there as well that don't rely on slavery. Consequently, leaders in these border slave states were more willing than those in the lower south to seek a compromise. Without waiting for their sister slave states to the north, delegates from the deep south met in Montgomery, Alabama on February 4th to establish the Confederate States of America. So here, let's take a look at the Confederate States of America. These blue states secede first, and they gather in Montgomery, and they make their own constitution for the Confederate States of America. The resulting constitution was surprisingly similar to that of the United States. Most of the differences merely spelled out traditional Southern interpretations of the federal constitution we have today. The central government was denied the authority to impose protective tariffs, or the thing that caused the nullification crisis, subsidize internal improvements or interfere with slavery in the states, and was required to pass laws protecting slavery in the territories. At the convention, they choose their provisional president, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi. So let's take a look at Learning Target 3 and the Civil War actually beginning so in March of 1861, Lincoln takes office and tells the South in his inaugural address that he does not want to interfere with slavery, but he will not accept secession, and he will preserve the Union. His view of, con of the Constitution is that states cannot leave the Union once they agree to be a part of it. And he told the South there would be no war unless they started it. Well, they did at the Battle of Fort Sumter in South Carolina. The southern states immediately, as soon as they become a country, seize federal forts within their borders. So they take over supplies uh, from the United States that were used to be in the south, but are now in the Confederate states. Four forts remain in Union control, including Fort Sumter. It's in Charleston Harbor which was under pressure from the Confederacy and running low on food. Against the advice of some of his cabinet, Lincoln decided to send a ship to resupply the fort. Before the ship uh, arrives, the Confederate army attacks the forts. 
And after two days of heavy bombardment, the, uh, the Union forces surrender, and the Confederate flag is raised over Fort Sumter. The Confederacy has won Fort Sumter without a single death on either side. And on April 15th, Lincoln proclaims that an insurrection against federal authority exists in the Deep South and calls on the militia of the loyal states to provide 75,000 troops for short-term service to put it down. So here is a review of the events that lead to secession. The cause is they're trying to worry that they may eliminate states in original southern states, people like Lincoln. The Democrats are split into two parties. The Republicans nominate Lincoln and call for an end to slavery in the territories. The Democratic Party nominates two presidential candidates. And Lincoln wins the election without a single southern electoral vote. That's the important one. And the effects, South Carolina secedes along with the six other deep states. The Confederate States of America is formed on February 4th, 1861. The Crittenden Compromise was kind of a last second deal that the North rejected. And Confederates defeat the Union at Fort Sumter. And that is our lesson for today. I'll talk to you more about it in class.